Um, next thing I want to move on to is um, you as a person, right? You're a Pan-African, mm-hmm. but you're a Christian also. And it was intriguing to me. So I just want to hear where did you get this conviction in Christianity as a, I would say, a militant <laughs> Pan-African, right? You know, yeah, so you know, Malcolm X said it best. He says, uh, Nation of Islam is my religion but my politics is black power, right? Because when he, when he looked at it, he realized one thing, that religion is only one aspect of who we are. I don't have to reconcile because I started to read my Bible very early. And then I saw all these different names and I said, but wait, these places are in Africa. So I got a Bible, it was actually called the Bible of African uh, Heritage in about 1996. And I began to trace the different places that connected to Africa. Didn't get the schooling as yet. I was just going through by myself. And I see Havila, right? One of the rivers that flow from the Garden of Eden. And Avila is in Ethiopia, right? Then I look at the different um, names for, for Africa, because Africa is a more recent name. Mizraim, Canaan, Put, uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, Cyrene, right, for Libya. And I said, but... Africa is profound and very present in the Bible. But how did I connect it is when I began to realize that the Europeanized version of Christianity was not the only version of Christianity. It was the one that was deployed to oppress people from Africa. But then I began to study and saw that by the first century, Christianity was for the most part a North African and a Central Asian religion, right? Finding groundings in Ethiopia, Ethiopia being the second oldest Christian nation in the world, only after Armenia, right? That Egypt and Nubia are Christian up until the ninth century. I begin to realize that what is happening is that we have connected Christianity only to whiteness and to oppression without understanding that there were many versions of Christianity, the Coptic version, from which we get the Ethiopian Orthodox and Coptic Church and the Egyptian uh, Coptic Church. So I began to find for myself, and then I ground it back in Marcus Garvey. And, and Marcus Garvey said, if we are made in his image and likeness, if I am black, then God is black, right? So Marcus Garvey began to do what we call black anthropomorphism. He says, if we are made in his image and likeness, I don't have any problem the white man telling me that God is white, but he can't tell me that God isn't black because I am black. So I began to, Reason in such a way where I didn't have to assume that God was white simply because I was told so. The Bible confirms that the historical Jesus, pale skin, dark skin, woolly hair man, no man walking around in the desert in sandals in the Near East at that time could look like the, the, um, the Almanac Atachi, what they used to give us in Jamaica, with the, with the man with the heel around him, head on him. No, he, he couldn't have looked like that. So when you study history, the historical Jesus cannot look like the one that was given to our ancestors that said, this is the only way you see him, right? Jesus was a historical figure. However, you want to image God, Jesus was a historical figure. He was living and breathing. And I remember about 10 years ago, even uh, Europeans had to conclude that he could not look like how he was portrayed for centuries. I'll give you a story. between the first century and the 15th century, when Europe begins to come out of the dark ages. So in those 1400 years, we have over 3000 depictions of Jesus. And it didn't become standardized to look European for the most part until after the Renaissance. You know, a quick, if you mentioned the religious and the political aspect as two separate entity. And if only you use Malcolm X as the example too, because recall when he informed the Muslim Mosque Inc. and the OAAU, that was mm-hmm. a question where he did face at yep. a particular time too. You ever, you ever see any particular um, instances where the political view and the religious view clash being a, being a Pan-African? I see it clash, but most times we think of contradictions as a way um, to to drop one thing, right? Life is about contradictions, right? And so how I I resolve it is what is most important, 
Religion is a fundamental value because it's not just rites and rituals. It is how I have been taught to teach and to, and, and to treat other people. And so for me, the political is a framework because I think of politics not just as government and, and I think of politics as decision making, right? When you think of the Pan-African cause, it is a political cause, but it is also a religious cause because there's a, there's a tendency within Pan-Africanism called Ethiopianism, right? Talking about the centrality of Africa to the black man. And so maybe I gave the impression of a, a false dichotomy, right? Because religion is infused with politics and politics is infused with religion, right? because it is how we understand the world and how we operate in the world. So my religious conviction actually helps me to advance my Pan-African conviction. Because when Marcus Garvey prophesies from, from Psalm 68 that Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to God and princes shall come out of Egypt, what that said to me was the centrality and the central importance of Africa. And so for me, the religious call was always a political call. And uh, next question I have for the religion before we move forward. Do you view the biblical stories as allegory or historically accurate? So there are several different approaches to uh, the Bible, right? Um, some of the Bible can be thought of as allegory. Some of it can be thought of as uh, historical, right? Some of it can be thought of as using story as narrative. So there are many different types of, of, of writings. One of the limitations that we would understand is that if, if, if you take a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview, the world must have started at some point. We don't know the exact starting point. And so the time between then and when man begins to write, maybe millions of years, right? Because my Bible tells me that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, right? So there's a part of time that we don't know. So let us be clear. When we talk about Noah and the flood, let's use that because everybody that wants to talk about allegory uses that, right? There were many other Near East traditions concerning the destruction of the world by a flood. But let us put world there with an asterisk. The world that the people there in the Near East know of. Because remember now, in those times, the average person did not travel more than five to 10 miles from their house, right? So when you talk about the world, you're talking about like right here, so in Brooklyn, or right here, so in Queens, right? That is the world to you. And so we have to understand the story within the context that even while Adam and Eve are the progenitors of the human race, people are scattered out of their generation elsewhere and begin to populate the world. So though the story is unfolding in that part of North Africa and Central Asia, people are pushing out elsewhere in the world. So the entire world could not have been destroyed by a flood, right? So, so it, it is not an attempt to dismiss the authenticity of the story. It is how we talk about when we talk about the world and the earth. We can only talk about where we know. And our understanding then before man could fly on a plane was pretty limited, right? By the time the Roman Empire comes around, we begin to see people navigating from as far as Spain, right? All the way through to Egypt was the Roman Empire. That is thousands of miles in the relation to what man used to move before uh, he knew that, you know, that kind of navigation could take place. So for me, it's a collection of different approaches to, to a story that has a particular beginning and a particular end. So... I reconcile it that way that everything doesn't have to be taken literal because there are poetic books in the Bible. There are historical uh, books in the Bible because I have, I, I have cross-checked the story of many of the pharaohs in the Bible with that of the 31 dynasties in Egypt, right? So you can think of the Bible as part of the story of history unfolded, but not the only story. I... I <laughs> Is is that intriguing? That is an intriguing uh, statement, you know, because you know, the the main reason why it's intriguing is the, that is because the average Christian when you come across, or at least when me come across, when it's time for reason, all of these preconceived notions and the whole concept and the whole thought process that this is literal, everything is literal. There is no allegory at all. 
this took place. Then we introduce new thought. Them tell you, say, once your thought deviated from this, this particular thing that they know in the Bible, then it's out of line or it's somewhat immoral. So how we actually, um, how we really, what, what would you say to those particular individuals? Come I feel like it's like them cast a judgment over anybody who don't see this thing as literal. So even your statement, me, could, me can't find some Christians personally who would have kind of lick out against or lash out against your particular statement due to the way how them practice their, their belief. And that's all right, because let me just sit on my back broad. So, you know, I am good with that because it doesn't, it doesn't shake my, 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 my fundamental Christian conviction. Because here's the problem. I grew up in a, with a notion of Christianity that say you don't question anything. It's a Jamaican notion. You don't question God, right? And then I started to read and I said, but the entire book of Job is a man flinging some hard questions to God about the cosmos. And then God never quest, God never answered me. No. God just gave him back some more questions. So it says to us that God doesn't get small because we question him. He doesn't get small because we doubt him. So to that person, I say to them that you have to understand that knowledge is there. Paul was a philosopher. And he debated with the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill. So how you're going to tell me that knowledge is devilish, right? That, that to reason and to comprehend how the world comes into place, but also how you can connect some of the things that happen in the Bible and how you can relate them to, uh, to life today and how that you can be educated and still be a Christian. Because I have had this conversation many times. Every time they hear that I'm going for next degree, they say, boy, I don't know if he's a Christian again enough. Because they have equated higher knowledge with the loss of faith. But here's the correlation for me. The higher my knowledge went is a, is a greater and deeper my faith went. Because my faith was not in what I was taught. It is what is in the Bible. Because so much, so much of what Christians are taught, they have never engaged the scripture. Them can't tell you where the scripture from. They have never studied it. They have never looked at the context. Right? So, I thought you know this. Joel 2.13, we grow up here, surrender your heart and not your garment. And the Bible don't say that. The Bible says, rend, which is to tear. Tear your hearts because the people were, were not changing their heart. They were just changing their clothes. And Joel said, Tear your heart and not your garment. And tell that to the average Jamaican. They tell us it's a render your heart and not your garment. In other words, no you tell them that for me yourself. Eh? <laughs> I, I better you tell them that me because when it come from me, you just hear say, oh, true. Oh, no, man. No, man. Are... <laughs> maybe, after, maybe after this, they'll, um, they'll attempt to excommunicate me. <laughs> but, 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 that, but that is the important thing that when you know God for yourself, when you have studied the scripture, you are not offended when a man comes to you with a question. Paul was never offended when the Greek philosophers came to him about hedonism and eudaimonia, right? What is pleasure? And is God a hedonist? You ask the average Christian them question and how them, them chant down fire by you. But, but knowledge is there for us to, to access. And God isn't depreciated because we learn more. And, and the thing, too, is just the lack of knowledge that I've noticed. People get very defensive, and I think they get defensive because it's a combination of lack of knowledge and lack of faith. I know that especially with religious people, they need everyone to constantly validate what they're doing when they're on the fence. But they also have a notion that everything they say has to be the right way without ever understanding that you don't win some, someone over to Christianity by proving to them that you know everything. It is also an honesty in accepting that you don't know everything. And that is, and, and that wins far more people into Christianity than trying to win an argument. I learned that at you, you know. I learned that at you because a brother took me on one day and him I tell me, said the black, a white man write the Bible and him go on and him go on and him go on. And I said, was, was there a single author of the Bible? No. How many years was the Bible written over? I said, was the Bible written in, 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 in Europe? No. So I said, but what's the argument they're making then? So we may have translations that come there, but most of the Bible survives in Africa and Asia, right? 
So we have to historicize where the Bible comes from, where the scripture comes from, right? We have used 500 years of European colonization and enslavement to disregard a book that existed before uh, colonialism and enslavement. And that for me is a problem. When a man said, well, it's a, a, a white man Bible and white man write the Bible. I said, you are saying to me that the, the 3,000 and 4,000 year tradition of the Coptics and people living in uh, Egypt and Nubia and Ethiopia and all those scribes in the Near East and in Cyrene in Libya, those people don't figure into the story of the Bible because we have only used what has happened from 1454 when the first Portuguese get to the Congo and begin to colonize Africa. That's where our understanding of the Bible starts. But I go back um, beyond that and go back to Ethiopia, where by 325, Ethiopia is a Christian nation and it wasn't forced upon them. Well, let me hear you say.